to tell you a little bit about myself and where I came from. Most people, when you see them, you see them in church, you see them in different places, you have an idea of what they are. But uh, for me, my background and where I was really has molded and shaped me in my life. I want to tell you a little about where I came from. I was born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, July 4th, 1959. I was one of eight children. I grew up Catholic. And my mom always wanted me to be a priest growing up. But that didn't happen. And partially because at age 14, I discovered uh, drugs and alcohol and got quite involved in that for the next 10 plus years. Um, worse than that, though, worse than the drugs and alcohol, was that I developed a hardness that had to do with anything to do with God. My heart, my heart. And again, I'm not blaming anybody. These were all choices and bad choices that I made for myself. At the age of 37, there was a series of events that happened in my life. The first, that my grandfather, who was 100, passed away. And second, about the same time, I almost lost my job at where I worked. And I didn't realize it at the time, but God used these two events in my life to get me to question what I was doing and where I was headed. When my grandfather died, I received a giant white King James Version coffee table Bible. One of those giant ones that you see about that thing. And I had it sitting on the table on my bed for about a week. When I walked into my room one day and I heard God's voice say, it was a loud, it was an audible voice, read the Bible. Needless to say, it scared me to death. So I started reading the Bible in secret. I didn't know anything about reading the Bible. I thought it was like any other book. You just open from the beginning and you start to read page one. I didn't know you could open and start from the middle. I didn't know you could read this or that. And and for me, some people some people like the King James Version, but for me, these and thous and stuff, I didn't understand the thing I was reading. So fast forward about a month. And Carrie and Rich McNamara were going to start a Bible study in their home. And I said to Laura, yeah, I'll go. But when the time came, I remember saying, I'm and I had two Bibles at the time. One was a children's Bible, a picture Bible. I wasn't going to take that. So I took my giant King James Version coffee table Bible with me. It was a big one. So I get over the, I get over the Bible study. Everybody's got these little Bibles. Mine was like this big. It's one of these ones where you go like that. So I took it with me. And they decided that they were going to study the book of John. And um, I learned things and heard things that I probably maybe have heard before. But the Holy Spirit was working in me and they, and they were falling onto a heart that needed it. It was like a dry, parched heart that needed moisture, needed refreshing, and needed God's rain. And I heard things about Jesus that I never heard before, or probably never wanted to hear before. Um, a month later, I was driving home from work. It was 4.20 in the afternoon. On January 15, 1997. And I was listening to a program called Focus on the Family on WRBS. And that was a miracle itself. I was listening to Christian music, Christian radio. There's a man on there named Adrian Rogers, he has since passed away, who was talking about a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And I wanted it. I wanted what he was talking about. And later on, after the talk, he said, would you pray with me? And I prayed. It was a simple prayer. It wasn't any big, long prayer. But basically, it was asking God to forgive me of my sins. 
And it, and it was asking Jesus Christ to come and be the Lord and Savior of my life. And I have to tell you, something happened to me that was like a lightning bolt came out of heaven as I was driving. And went through my body. And I knew in an instant, I knew in an instant, every sin, everything I'd ever done in my life, I knew at that instant God forgave me. I was a brand new person. I left for work that day, same person. I came back a different person. I was born again. I was a new person. And I didn't know it at the time, but I later learned that that was what was called being filled by God's Holy Spirit. Okay, so that was 20 years almost to the day. 19 years, 10 months to the day. Okay, so let me, let me backtrack 46 years. One thing I enjoyed since an early child was hunting and fishing. When I was 9 through 11, my dad would take me with him. And I didn't carry a gun or anything, but I would follow along behind him in the woods. And those were, those were just drink-it-in moments for me. I love being in the woods. I love being with my dad. Most of the time we went was October, November. And we would usually leave before the sun came up. And it was usually cold. So we'd be tramping through the woods. And he'd be like, okay, Daniel, let's sit over here. So we'd sit there. And being dark and being this time of year, as things I remember were, you could hear the leaves falling. And it sounded like raindrops falling. But when you're in the woods and it's quiet, you wouldn't believe the stuff you could hear. You'd hear all these leaves falling all around you. I remember the smells of the leaves. You know how like in the fall when you're raking leaves and you smell the leaves and it's such a great smell. I remember smelling those leaves. Um, the other thing was, we'd be sitting there, and like I said, I'd be sitting there and I'd be cold. And, and then you'd see the sun start coming up. And when you're in the woods, the sun's rays will hit you before the morning. And you can see them creep, you know, I can hear you. You can see the sun's rays creep across the church. But you can see the sun's rays creep across the woods. And in a little while, the warmth of the sun would follow them. And uh, I would, that was just the greatest times for me. And on, on many a morning, uh, the sun would come up. You can uh, go and see it. It would be green or not green, reddish orange in the morning. <clears throat> and I remember there would be a Canadian, flock of Canadian geese that would be flying over the woods and in that still the morning they sounded so loud. And I remember my dad would always comment, oh, Daniel, there's no more beautiful sound in all of nature than that. So that was, but during that time of spending time with my dad, I also learned a skill and that was tracking and trail. Because when you hunt, sometimes you have to track and trail. And I became the best tracker in my family, even at a young age. Because I listened to my dad, and I paid attention to what was going on around me. I know the tendencies of animals, how they act. I know how they move in the woods, and the type of terrain they travel. And you learn to pay attention to the smallest details. Maybe an overturned leaf, a piece of hair, a stick out of place, a little tiny speck of blood that may be the size of a pinhead. And at times, you would lose the trail. And my dad would always say, go back to the last place you saw some sign and work it out. And that's what we would do. And 99 times out of 100, you would go back to the last place you saw some sign, some sign, and you'd work it out and you'd find what you're trailing. Now, being a, I've been a Christian almost 20 years, and for me, there's been times where I feel like I've lost my trail. I've lost the trail I've been tracking as a Christian. In those instances, I remember the words of my dad saying, go back to the last place you saw some sign. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, for me, I go back to the last thing I heard him say to me. And I figured the last thing he said to me 
is still what he wants me to do. And when he wants to, me to do something different, he'll tell me so. So for me, years ago, I went to Priscilla, and I came back from Priscilla all fired up, like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? You want me to come missionary? You want me to come priest? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And I remember saying, in a voice, I want you to be a servant. And I was like, okay, okay, I'll be a servant. What do you want me to do? And, and I was sitting quiet one day. And the same day, he said, be a servant. And I was sitting quiet. It was like an hour later. And he said, I just want you to love me. So for me, when I lose my track, my trail, I go back to be a servant and love Jesus. same principles apply to the church. And we need to go back to the last thing that Jesus told us to do and do it. We need to be obedient. So what was the very last command Jesus gave us? The last command he gave us is found in Matthew 28, 16 through 20. We call it the Great Commission. Because he gave us that command and then he went to heaven. So that was the last command he gave us. A commission is an authorization or a command to act in a prescribed manner or to perform a prescribed act. It's a charge. That's the charge that he has given us. <clears throat> so I'm going to read that. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you to the end of the age. Jesus, who has all authority on heaven and earth, has given us the authority to act on his behalf. To make disciples of all nations. And to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I believe baptism has a much deeper meaning when Jesus spoke these words. I think we've maybe we've lost it a little bit. Okay, let's say I owe Richard some money. I can put myself, now when I talk about slavery, I don't mean like the 1800s slavery. It's more of an indentured servant slavery, where I'm working for someone and them alone. <coughs> Let's say I owe Richard some money. I can put myself into slavery under, his, under him to pay off the debt for a certain amount of time. Like let's say I owe Richard $1,000 and I didn't have it. Well, I could work for him for three years at $333 a year, and at the end of those three years, I'd be free. Now, I could place myself under permanent slavery, under Richard, if he and I mutually agreed it was good. I had to want to do it, Richard had to want to keep me. In Leviticus, Le Leviticus it talks about a slave owner pushing an awl through the ear of a, to mark a person as a slave. This was a Jewish custom. There's another practice that wasn't Jewish, and it's this. If a person agreed to become a slave, his owner's name would be tattooed on him, and he would be baptized in the owner's name as a sign of ownership. This was a common cultural practice, not a Christian practice. So when Jesus in Matthew 28 said, make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this would have been something very natural for new believers, especially non-Jewish people, to understand. And what they were saying was, by being baptized, in effect saying, I am willing to become a slave to Jesus, and I place myself under his ownership. So we've kind of lost that maybe a little bit, the meaning behind it, I think. So 
So by being baptized, they were in effect saying, I am willing to become a slave of Jesus Christ, and I place myself under his ownership alone. Paul spoke of being a slave often to Jesus. And when I, when I was thinking about this, this is kind of one of those connect the dots moments for me where I'm like, ah, oh, that gives me a new deeper meaning to, to baptism and the commitment that I made when I got baptized. And I have to say, for me, when I was thinking about this, it's also a gut check moment for me in two levels. But one, I have to ask myself, how am I doing personally with being a slave of Christ? And what changes do I need to make in my life? Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, I do need to make some changes. Maybe you're thinking, my, life for, my love for Christ has gotten cold. Have I lost the trail? The trail always leads to and from the foot of the cross. And maybe you need to get on that trail again. Go to the foot of the cross, the blood of Jesus. That's the trail as Christians that we follow. Maybe you need to recommit your life to Christ today. Ask yourself this question. Am I holding back anything from Jesus Christ? Are there rooms in my house, parts of my life, are there rooms in my house that I don't let him in? The second part is, how are we doing as a church? And what do we need to do to change? Are we making disciples? How are we doing looking outside our walls here? And this is a tough question we need to ask and think about. Would anyone other than the people of this church care if our doors closed tomorrow? If we only look inward, we're becoming danger of developing, developing a consumer mentality. What is the church doing for me? What's best for me? If we aren't careful, we can develop an attitude that thinks of ourselves first and not so good at thinking. What can we do better to carry the message of salvation and hope through faith in Jesus Christ out to the world so desperately needs it? And you don't have to turn the TV on more than five minutes and see that this world is a mess. And, and, and we think it's out there. It's here, too. It's in Reisterstown. It's in Baltimore. It's everywhere. So I'm going to have Susan play this video real quick. Beautiful new club was in chaos. Immediately, the property committee hired someone to rig a 
a shower outside the club where victims of the shipwreck would be cleaned up before coming inside. The outsiders made the life-saving station extremely dirty. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities because they felt that they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. But a small number of members insisted on life-saving as their primary mission and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. After all, the dissenting group's members were voted in and told that if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. So they did. As the years went by, however, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old station. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was found. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that eastern seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters. But most of the passengers drown. The following figures are from a report the diocese gave us in 2013. Now this is only a three square mile radius of All Saints, which is right out where I live. It's not far from here. So it goes all the way around us. In a three mile square radius live 41,505 people, which translates to 15,737 households. Of those people, 22% consider it important to attend religious services. 22%. That leaves 78%, or this is only in this little area, 32,373 people who don't consider it important to attend services or are unchurched. This is our mission field. This is our great commission. <laughs> So, going back to what do we do when we've lost the trail? We go back to last time we heard God speak. I believe two plus years ago, a group, a group was meeting to discern God's will. We determined that we would make a commitment to reach the unchurched. Part of it, I believe, is in place. I believe the Holy Spirit gave us the following statement. Our mission is to invite everyone to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And to share his message with our communities and the world. I believe we have the mission and vision in place. The challenge for us moving forward will be discerning how we take it out of the community. What vehicle will we use to reach the lost and unchurched? <clears throat> The following story is from Joshua chapter 10. It shows us an example of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility and how they play out and are intertwined. In chapter 9, the Gibeonites saved themselves by trickery, by wearing old clothes, having moldy food, and worn out animals, and approached Joshua so the Israelites would have pity on them and sign the treaty. It worked. Joshua had pity on them and signed an agreement. Okay, so fast forward to chapter 10. When King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem, who was an Amorite, heard the treaty, he got scared. And he made his own treaty with five other Amorite kings to attack the Israelites. Verse 7, Joshua went up from Gilgal. He and all the fighting force with him. All the mighty warriors. Verse 8, the Lord says to Joshua, Do not fear, for I have handed them over to you. No, not one of them shall stand before you. So God's sovereign will was that he would hand the Amorites over to the Israelite warriors, and all will be killed. That was God's will. Verse 9 says, Joshua came upon them, having marched all night long from Gilgal. That's all it says in verse 9. They marched all night. What was not told in 
verse 9 is that it was a 25 mile hike, 25 mile march in full battle gear, which took over 12 hours. And on top of that, there was an elevation change, which started at 1,300 feet below sea level and went up to 4,000 plus feet. So it was an uphill march in full battle gear all night long. It wasn't as easy as show up in their ears. Verse 10 says, The Lord threw the Amorites into panic before Israelite, or Israel, and they inflicted a great slaughter on them. Verse 11 says, As they fled, the Israelites' God threw huge stones on them from heaven. And it goes on to say that more died because of the hailstones than the Israelites killed with their swords. So, God's sovereign will was that the Amorites would be slaughtered by the Israelites. Our response, man's responsibility, was they had to march all night uphill in full battle gear, and that was just getting to the fight. They had to join the battle. It doesn't say how many Israelites were killed. But you can be sure, with forces that large, it cost them something. It cost them something. The victory was theirs, but they had to fight. It may cost us something moving forward. We may have to make tough decisions. I'm a very optimistic person. I've seen God at work here for years. I've seen my faith grow. My faith and knowledge and love for the Lord grow here. God's not going to stop that. I've seen God at work here this year, and it gives me, especially it gives me a lot of confidence when I see the group that he has assembled for the search committee. Each one of these people loves Jesus Christ. I know, they do. And when you have a group of people who love Jesus Christ and to discern his will, I know that God is going to, they are going to find the person for us. But we may have to do something. I know our numbers are shrinking. We may have to ask ourselves, what can we do better to reach out and reach the lost? I don't know what the future of this church is, but I trust it. I trust it for its outcome. Please pray with me. Father, we do praise you. We come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your unfailing love. We thank you for how we've seen our lives change and how we're different than we used to be. We thank you that your grace and mercy is poured out upon us. Continually. Give us eyes and ears to see those around us as you see them, Lord. Help us to see those around us as people who need to know you. And you may be here today and you may be thinking, I've lost my trail. I'm not quite as hot for the Lord as I used to be. The trail's gotten cold. I pray, Lord, if there's anybody here that you would speak into their heart right now and reveal yourself to them. That they would recommit their lives to you. Not just today, but every day of their life. We trust our lives in this church in your hand. Amen.